I'm in the former Soviet state of Ukraine, exploring an area with a long history of lake monsters, where I've just learnt of a diver reportedly having his hand ripped off by a giant fish, rumoured to live in the cooling pond of the abandoned Chernobyl reactor. In the early hours of April 26, 1986, the safety systems at reactor number four were temporarily shut down for an experiment. Moments later, an unexpected power spike caused a series of huge explosions. They tore through the reactor, exposing hundreds of tons of intensely radioactive material to the surrounding environment. Good evening. That Soviet nuclear disaster is probably the worst in history. Radioactivity is still being sent into the atmosphere. With reports that as many as 2,000 people may have been killed and a dangerous fire continues to burn. Emergency crews battled night and day to control the raging fires. There was a chemical explosion which caused a core meltdown. That is the most severe of the nuclear accidents that can occur. And an 18-mile security zone has been set up around the site. Today, nearly 30 years later, this exclusion zone is still under strict military protection and control. Only authorized personnel may enter. When I set out, I never imagined that I'd end up heading for the site of the world's worst ever nuclear accident, Chernobyl. The question that's on my mind is whether this fearsome fish, the Somme, has survived in the cooling pond. Is it still there? And if it has, has the radiation maybe caused it to mutate into something potentially even more terrifying? The word mutant instantly conjures up visions of deformed giants, gargantuan products of ionizing radiation. Could the Somme really have met a similar fate? Very few people are allowed through the gates guarding Chernobyl's exclusion zone. So there's a lot of control going on here. Very closely guarded zone. Fishing gear has raised questions. This is not a place where fishing is allowed. Ever since the accident, fishing within the zone has been completely outlawed. They're being very thorough about checking that I've got everything, that the paperwork's in order. The authorities approve my preliminary paperwork and I'm granted temporary access to the periphery of the zone. Chernobyl consists of multiple jurisdictions, much like a Russian doll, each layer giving way to the next and all requiring a new level of permission. For my own safety, I'm restricted to just five consecutive days of exposure. This is a fishing trip unlike any other. I've got a couple of things here that I wouldn't normally have with me. These will keep track of the total amount of radioactivity that I'm exposed to. But this thing, this thing's really my guardian angel. This will go everywhere with me. This will read in real time the level of radioactivity around me. If I'm anywhere where the reading's particularly high, there's an alarm that will go off. Crucially, though, this device also shows me how close I'm getting to my radiation limit a maximum set by safety experts that must not be exceeded in my five days. Any exposure to radiation incurs an increased risk of cancer, and staying within this limit is essential for my safety. If I reach it, I'll have no choice but to leave Chernobyl immediately. The countdown has begun. Under the gaze of the reactor stands the city of Pripyat. Prior to the accident, it was a thriving community built to house the thousands of power plant workers and their families. It was a model city for the nuclear age. Now, it lies completely abandoned. To see ancient ruins overrun by vegetation is one thing. To see a modern city like this is something else entirely. 
and the silence in this place is really quite spooky. What happened here? What was the story? Well, what happened was a mass evacuation. 50,000 people told to leave, and they left in a matter of hours, and they were told that they would be back in three days. Well, it's now nearly 30 years, and they never came back. This whole area is still radioactive. It won't return to normal for tens of thousands of years. And the levels of radiation, they vary. There are localized hotspots where the level might be several hundred times what it is just a few feet away. Without my specialized equipment, I'd have no idea what I was being exposed to or how quickly I was approaching my limit. Just as the men, women, and children of Pripyat were unaware of the danger they faced, from this invisible threat. The full death toll will never be known, though it's clear that it lies in the thousands and continues to rise to this day. Ice-capped mountains, wild rivers, and isolated coves. Southern Alaska may be spectacular, but this remote land can be a harsh and treacherous place. Recent reports have caught my eye of fishermen disappearing, vanishing without a trace. But for every case that makes the papers, others appear to go unreported. Sometimes people will be on a trip just having a pleasure day, and they never come back. My name's Jeremy Wade. For many years, I've been investigating mysterious disappearances on rivers and lakes, revealing the strange and sometimes deadly creatures that lurk beneath the surface. In Alaska, mysterious deaths are commonly blamed on boating accidents or bad weather. But with a growing case file, I'm beginning to wonder if these deep, forbidding waters are in fact concealing a cold water killer. So the SOM attacked the diver. The SOM managed